It's now my pleasure to introduce Denise Grattan, who has been a public defender in Orange County for over 25 years, providing legal defense for people charged with capital crimes. Her presentation is entitled Confessions of a Public Defender. So without further ado, welcome, Denise. Hi. So that title was kind of a placeholder while I thought about what I really wanted to say for the next 20 minutes. I've been a public defender for over 20 years. I'm actually retired, but still working with the public defender's office. I have represented people charged with every crime you could be charged with. And as you just heard, my last 25 years or so have primarily been taken up with murder cases and capital murder cases. So um, in thinking about what to talk about here, I decided what I wanted to talk about was why our current system is not only non-productive, it's counterproductive. And some of the things that I'm going to talk about, I've heard um, bits and pieces from other speakers earlier this morning, but I hope this synthesizes it. And also this is based not on academic work that I've done, although I've read many books and articles and so forth about the criminal justice system, but it's also based on my experience talking to these people talking to their families, going in their homes. Uh, when you represent a capital defendant, you're not just defending against the criminal charges. You have to find out why the person ended up where they ended up and try to explain that to a jury because the choice of punishment is based on more than just the crime. It's based on the person themselves, why they did what they did, what led them to that place. So. There are two huge misconceptions that are the cornerstone of our criminal justice system that lead us down the wrong path. And those are number one, a completely inaccurate view of free will, right? So the whole system is based on the notion that we all have the ability to do whatever we want. Our whole nation is based on that. You know, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, if you really want to succeed, you will succeed. Uh, it just takes effort. People who don't succeed are just slackers or just want to do drugs or, or whatever. And that's just a total crock. It's not that there's not such a thing as free will. There is such a thing as free will. But free will is narrowed by a variety of circumstances. And, you know, an easy way to look at this is if you're five foot two, you can practice every day for 12 hours a day, you're not going to make the NBA. Okay. It's not a matter of free will, whether you're going to be in the NBA. That's just a matter of genetics. In a broader sense, I became an attorney. That was an act of free will. I made the choice to go to college. I made the choice to go to law school. I made the choice to study. But I also was born to a middle-class family of professional people. I was a third generation female in my family to go to college. I wasn't beaten. I wasn't molested. I, I had a stable childhood. I went to good schools. I didn't have to worry about being shot every time I walked out the door. You know, so my free will decision to go to college is not the same as someone else's free will who didn't grow up under those circumstances going to college. It's just not the same choice. So this kind of notion that at age 18, we're all on an equal playing field, as much as there's a segment of our society that really believe that, is simply not true. And so the notion that the criminal justice system can punish everybody equally for crimes they commit because it's all based on free will and people have the choice whether to engage in this behavior is unrealistic. And then the second big assumption of the criminal justice system that is erroneous is an unrealistic, what I believe is religiously slash puritanically, you know, how, wherever you want to think this came from, division of society into good people and bad people. So people who go to prison are bad people, people who don't are good people. And as we all know from our life experiences, no one is all good and all bad. No one is good all the time or bad all the time. Even if you want to be as simplistic as to call things good and bad, good and evil, people are much more complex than that. And so the sort of old saying that good people can do bad things, bad people can do good things, that's not something the criminal justice system takes account of. And it's not something that politicians that run on views on the criminal justice system 
accept and acknowledge, right? If you've watched anything in this election cycle, one party has been very loud about locking up all the bad people. We just have to lock up the bad people or the bad people are coming over the border. This overly simplistic view of human behavior is um, replicated in the criminal justice system and in the penal system and is completely counterproductive. So what are the true causes of crime? The elements that go into somebody ending up in a bad place in terms of criminal behavior are myriad. And these are just a few. These are just ones I've seen in my investigation of cases. Family history, and by family history, I mean going back generations, because bad things are happening with grandparents. They, that gets passed down both genetically and uh, sociologically to parents, to the children. So if you look back at your family history, if I look back at mine, like I said, I'm third generation of women in my family to go to college. I look at my mother who went to college. It's because she came from two parents that went to college and that was a value and so on and so forth. Same thing on the other side. So on the other hand, if you're third generation gang member in a gang member family or third generation in a family where there's been physical or sexual abuse or poverty or living in uh, polluted environments where there's lead pollution or other kinds of environmental pollution, those things have an impact on you going back generations. So if you have grandparents that were affected that way, they're going to pass stuff on to your parents who are going to pass stuff on to you. Prenatal history, which is kind of obvious. Uh, people who end up in these problems tend to have parents who are not very functional. So parents who drink, parents who use drugs, parents who are in food deserts, so they don't have proper prenatal nutrition. If any of you followed the Parkland shooting trial, that was the young man who went into a school in Parkland and killed 20 people. Uh, he just recently had his penalty phase in Florida. His mother was a uh, drunk and a, and a drug addict who came from family of people with substance abuse. He was given up for adoption after his mother had done drugs and drank all through his the pregnancy. He ended up needing psychiatric care from age three on, age three on. So, you know, that, that he ended up at age 19 shooting up a school is related to the fact that he was, his mother was so screwed up that he ended up needing psychiatric care at age three on. That's a good example of what I mean by free will. You know, someone under those circumstances is not operating under complete free will uh, 18 years later, 19 years later. The physical environment in which someone grows up and the family environment, obviously abuse, but even more subtle things. For example, I had a client that I was trying to talk the DA out of seeking death on. And one of the arguments they gave me for why they wanted to seek death is he had all these prior gun related arrests and convictions back in North Carolina. Well, I went back to North Carolina and I went and visited his family members. I visited his mother and had an interview with a handgun on the coffee table between the two of us. I went to see his uncle who informed me that he had 37 guns hidden in his double wide. I went to a cousin's house, went to the bathroom, and there was a shotgun behind the bathroom door. So when I opened the door, the rifle, fell, or the shotgun fell down. So I could go back and tell the DA, you know, when this guy can't stop getting guns, it's not the same as if you're not getting guns. His whole family is awash in guns. He can't go to a family function without a gun. So the fact that he was a felon and still had guns in North Carolina, not really the same thing. He lives in a family where having a gun is like having a fork. In fact, I think those people use their guns more than they use their forks. Even non-abusive family environments, if they're family environments that are unusual or dysfunctional in some other way, have an impact on the children that come out of those environments. Obviously, abuse and neglect, but you don't have to, you know, think about how carefully you take care of your kids. All of you who have had kids or have kids who have kids, how carefully do we take care of our kids? We're worried about every cough and sniffle. We cry when they start going to school because they're not going to be under our care anymore. And we're worried about whether they're going to get bullied and stuff. We um, drive them to their soccer games. We sweat when they first get the driver's license and they're out driving the car. You can abuse a kid by not caring about a kid and be almost as destructive as if you beat the kid up. So when we talk about abuse and neglect, 
we're not just necessarily talking about stringing a kid up by his thumbs or leaving him on a park bench somewhere for three days. Children growing up in a family where they're not getting nurtured and supported by their parents, where they're having to bring themselves up, are kids who are not learning because their energy is being delegated to raising themselves. They're not learning how to deal with other people and deal with stressful situations and learn resilience. That's how we learn all that stuff. We learn it from, you know, our the same way we learn how to ride a bike. Our parents are pushing the bike, we're pedaling. Ultimately, we can pedal by ourselves, okay? Same thing um, when you're growing up as a kid. If you don't have parents pushing, then you're using more energy trying to ride that bike that you could be using other places. Systemic racism and not nearly enough time to go into systemic racism except to point out that critical race theory is absolutely accurate and appropriate and should be taught. But systemic racism, not just now, but again, generations past have an enormous impact on people's ability to succeed in life. Poverty, inadequate educational resources. And again, we know that educational resources tend to follow wealth so that people who are in more impoverished areas also tend to have worse educational resources. Substance abuse, mental health issues. We've heard a lot about mental health issues already today. Still very, in terms of the criminal justice system, still not very good grasp on mental health issues beyond obvious schizophrenia or obvious psychotic illnesses of some sort, but knowledge and recognition of the impact of bipolar disorder, depression, other personality disorders, as the psychotic type personality disorders, all of those have an impact obviously on behavior and ability to cope. One thing I didn't put in here is age. I've heard that was on people who have been in prison that we've had to have talked to us this morning. Big part of why they've been able to succeed when they did is just plain age. It's just plain, you know, our brains do not fully develop until we're about 25 years old. That's just the way it works. For a lot of this population, once they hit their 30s, their 40s, that criminal behavior starts to diminish or go away altogether. Their ability to assess why they're where they are and what they need to do to get out of that situation is much better. And then all of this stuff has synergistic. Incarceration makes it worse because these are already vulnerable people for all those reasons and the synergistic effects of all those kinds of factors. And now they're being exposed to the stressful, dangerous, and politically complicated environment. So they can't make it on the outside, right? So let's put them in a place where they have to worry about being stabbed every day, where they have to navigate what gangs to be friends with and who not to be friends with and who to talk to and who not to talk to and all that. You know, let's put them in there because they're sure to succeed there when they couldn't make it out in a somewhat less complicated environment. Obviously, lack of consistent, effective care of their individual needs beyond the big stuff like drug programs and psychiatric, but learning things like resiliency and coping. One thing about the last couple of speakers we had who had been in prison, a lot of what they did, they had to do by themselves. They weren't really getting it from factors inside the prison. Restriction of contact with family members and support of friends. You've heard today about how expensive that is for people in custody. That's a great racket for GTEL and these other companies that make 40 cents a minute or whatever on these phone calls. Even with legislation, those phone calls are expensive. Plus the rules about letters and when you can call and visiting. Your family may be in San Diego and you get sent up to Shasta. You know, another really good thing to do to somebody who's already damaged stuff that they're committing crimes is separate them from their complete support network because that's a really healthy thing to do. Exacerbation of racial tensions and divisions. You know, this is an old one. When I was going to law school, I worked at the prison office at San Quentin and, and learned that, you know, what, what has been true throughout, which is prison guards benefit from setting racial groups against each other because then they're not fighting the prison guards. So they would rather have blacks hitting whites, Hispanics fighting whites, than any of them like getting together and saying, hey, you know what, things aren't really the way they should be in this prison. We should be taking action elsewhere. So, and then just the politics on a prison yard exacerbates those racial tensions and divisions. Institutionalization, the more you treat someone as an infant and give them 35 cents an hour as their allowance. Again, I don't know why you expect to shackle a man hand and foot for 10 years in prison and then they're going to be able to walk normally the minute they get out the door. 
ostracism from society during incarceration and after release. This kind of goes to the good and evil thing, that they are considered bad people if into prison, and the, and the whole notion of redemption, unless you're a really rich white Republican, is non-existent in society. Lack of post-release support. You know, I have clients on parole. I even have um, a client now who's on parole for murder um, after doing, long story, I don't have time for it, but he, he was in prison for, actually on death row for murder and ultimately ended up on probation. And if it weren't for me and others helping him, there, there's no way he would get through because the whole point of probation is just, I'm going to drug test you. I'm going to monitor your ankle bracelet and make sure you're not someplace you shouldn't be. And uh, that's about it. Lack of post-release support. You know, you have speakers today from some really good programs, but they're private programs and they're sporadic and they're not institutionalized across society. And then finally, difficulty entering or re-entering the job market, something that's exacerbated by licensing rules. For example, I'm sure you have read that firefighters who have been firefighters in the California penal system can't work as firefighters when they get out, no matter how much experience they had, how many dangers they faced as firefighter, inmate firefighters, because of their records, they can't get jobs as firefighters on the outside. So a recognition of the factors that go into criminal behavior, a recognition of the ways that incarceration exacerbate the causes of criminal behavior are crucial to understanding how to design a penal system that maximizes our chances of making society safe, as well as being a humane structure that recognizes the humanity of the people involved. We're going to open up the Q&A for you. Thank you, Denise. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, we have Neil coming at us again. Thank you, Neil. Hi. I don't know where to, where to start. I don't know you, <laughs> but I have to say I love you. <laughs> Uh, That's a good way to start. <laughs> good way to start. I was incarcerated 50 years ago. Oh, what's the question? It's just, I mean, everything you say is so correct. I mean, it, I mean the damage it done, I was, um, I was fortunate. I got a low sense because, as you can see, I'm a white guy. I was at a high-speed police chase that ended fatally. So I, I had to live with that in addition to being like it was a short sentence. It was, got reduced to three years. But still, the, what's, what is going to take to change? Like how to change things? I'm just so excited about the Scandinavian project. But because of the very things you said at the beginning, it's this good and bad morality. It's um, punishment, I think, goes back to, to England. It was brought over with the Puritans. It's just like, we're not going to get, we're not going to give it up. And, and we're not committed to helping people with problems. I mean, it's because a lot of people do have problems. I had problems. I, you know, even though I came from a working class family, you know, I didn't get beaten, but, you know, I had a father was a little intimidating. Uh, you know, it's, there's no structures, you know, like you pointed out. These guys had to pull themselves out, the guys on the call today. So I don't know, any comments around that? I think it's a couple things. I mean, first of all, I think we have to be unafraid and empower people in power, both politicians and bureaucrats, to be unafraid about talking about this stuff, right? It's such a third wire of politics to say anything that sounds George soros -y about criminal justice. In California, we're fortunate enough to live in a state where almost by stealth, there have been enormous reforms under Gavin Newsom. That's number one. So number one is we have to be able to talk to people about this stuff. We have to empower political actors. We have to tell political actors that we have voting power, and this is one of the issues we care about. And then number two is we have to, you know, this is resources. And I think we have to be clear in communicating with people in power about how we want resources used. And obviously, there's a lot of things we want resources for, but to the extent we can point to studies, like some of those that have been alluded to already today, that say that over the long term, this is cost effective, that we're going to save more money by having those services in schools, for example, by having those services uh, pre-trial or pre-incarceration, in Orange County, 
bless its little conservative heart, we've got things like veterans court and mental health court. So we do have these diversionary courts for specific populations that try and navigate them out of the criminal justice system and deal with their particular problems. We just have to make that case. The problem is these people, this population, they don't have a political base, right? Who speaks for them politically? And we're the only ones that can make that change because we're the ones who dictate ultimately what the political dialogue should be. So us talking amongst ourselves is great. It's educational. But ultimately, we don't have power unless we exercise it on those who are making the decisions. So I saw Abraham's hand up. If uh, you have a question, Abraham. Are you finding people who are in strategic places of authority? You mentioned Gavin Newsom, and certainly I am very grateful he's our governor. Is that kind of attitude, are you finding it nationwide that there are people that are on this page with you that understand these principles you've laid out and are also trying to bring change about? In isolated pockets. And I mean, that's where the George Soros comment came from. That has been one of Soros's pushes in the past 10 years has been looking for progressive, in his case, particularly district attorneys. John was speaking earlier about the latitude that, that district attorneys have. That's a place where he's trying to have an impact on the criminal justice system by supporting progressive district attorneys that are going to allocate their resources towards restorative justice to the extent possible. Um, And he's had success. The district attorney of Philadelphia, whose name escapes me, is a perennial right wing target. He just got reelected. Obviously, our district attorney in Los Angeles, who's also a progressive, George Gascon evaded being recalled earlier this year. So yeah, there are pockets and those pockets are things that we need to be educating other people about. Again, other people who have power to do things. Do you know if there's anybody really talking to the White House about these kind of things? I don't know. I do not. I've never read anything about having any particular, anyone with a particular portfolio around this. And certainly in Biden's statements or statements from other White House people about their agenda, this does not seem to be on their radar other than other than being anti-death penalty and basically saying, you know, after Trump killed 13 people during his presidency, saying they're not going to kill anybody. But other than that. Okay. (laughs) Yes. And Denise, as uh, somebody in Orange County, I really especially appreciate uh, your perspective and you know, just what you've given us here today. And I have to say, as a Southern California Secular Coalition, wanting to put together this conversation on something that all of us need to know more about, it's been so rewarding to have so many different perspectives here. Thank you for your view and what you're presenting to us. And But I definitely want to talk to you a little bit about some of those influencers right here in Orange County. And one of the things you mentioned is the whole discussion on childhood experiences and their effect on incarceration. And as many people know, a whole topic called adverse childhood experiences or ACE, ACE, 